This is Lesson 9, Patristic Ethics in the Course, Living Ethical Lives. This lesson, and the two that follow, will give a survey of theological ethics. For the past eight lessons, the module has introduced the practice of moral reflection. The primary material treated has been philosophical, but with this lesson, the specific task of this module will come into sharp focus. The patristic period is crucial in the development of Christian theology. The term patristic literally means father. Therefore, this is the period of the church fathers. These men were those who literally hammered out the Christian faith in this period uh, immediately following AD 100. The period normally treated as a patristic period is AD 100 to 600. It includes such people as Clement of Rome and Ignatius, and extends to the last great thinker of the patristic age, patristic age, Augustine of Hippo. Technically, one would associate patristic ethics with the earliest days of the church, followed by the Greek apologists and other important theologians. Well, imagine you are in the same position as those in the early church. There is no New Testament to which a person can refer. The first generation of disciples is dead. The basic patterns of worship is the, in the church are developing. There have been questions about what Jesus meant when he said, those who had seen him had seen the Father. There are those who see the church as a threat to the Jewish faith. There are those who see the church as little more than a sect within the Jewish faith. There are those who think it is best to embrace the Jewish faith again. There are those who think Jesus has come already. There are those who are attempting to separate faith from behavior. All of this is going on in the early church. Given this situation, what do you think uh, the Christian faith is about? What is essential about the Christian faith? What are the moral implications of these conclusions? Well, here are a few thoughts to consider as you contemplate these questions. The first theological conviction. The emerging Christian faith stands in continuity with Israel and the Old Covenant. Then there's moral conviction. The Christian faith must embrace the moral imperatives of the law while it realizes that in Christ all has been made new. Theological conviction. Jesus was the Christ of God. Moral conviction. The moral life is informed and shaped by the way God is in his life. The Christ is the paradigm of the moral life. Theological conviction. Jesus was truly a human being. Moral conviction. Since Jesus was a physical human being, a person with real flesh, it is possible to be moral in our physical life. Theological conviction. God is triune. That is, God is Father, Son, and Spirit. Moral conviction. Since God is an unfolding story, Father, Son, and Spirit, we have the grace and resource for the moral life. Theological conviction. God has called the church into being. Moral conviction. We are called to be together as God is together and with us. The church is a community of non-coercive discourse intending to provide vision and resource for the Christian life. Remember, the patristic church was in this precise position. This fact underscores the importance of our studying early church history as recourse for moral reflection. The patristic period, AD 100 to 600, is essential for Christian understanding. There is a sense in which this period belongs to all three of the great Christian traditions, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and Protestant. The patristic period begins with a struggle on two fronts. First, the early church needed to define itself in light of the history of Israel. The initial movements in this history can be traced back to the New Testament, but they continue well into the patristic, peri patristic period. Just what does it mean to say the church is the new covenant and the sign of the second covenant is baptism? Why does the Christian church call the Hebrew Bible the Old Testament? What will the church do with the law now that grace has been defined by Jesus on a cross? The second struggle for the early church was to define itself in light of classical culture. At first, this takes shape 
with the attempt to use philosophical categories to express the faith. The philosophy of Plato and its later version in Neoplatonism were very important in shaping the early church's theology. These two struggles, Judaism and classic culture, helped shape much of the way patristic theology and ethics emerged. Another reason this is such an important period relates to the debates internal to the church that helped shape the Christian faith. During this period, the church settled the question of the divinity and humanity of Jesus, first at the Council of Nicaea in 325, and then with the definition of Chalcedon, which happened in 451, the church determined to affirm Jesus as both human and God. While this was not a precise working out of how this was possible, it was an affirmation of both. Scripture was canonized during the patristic period. Early on, there were several versions of what was to become the New Testament. The late 4th century witnessed the final and definitive version of the New Testament and a joining of it to what was to become the Old Testament. This process was initiated by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and a desire to define the faith in the face of emerging heresies. This period of time was crucial for defining the liturgy and patterns of worship for the church. This period began to set in place the most basic Christian doctrine, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrines of the Holy Spirit and the church, salvation, sacraments, and so on, were hammered out in basic fashion in the patristic period. These 500 years truly belong to everyone. Along with doctrine, and in fact materially connected to the doctrinal development of the early church, the process of defining ethical convictions began. These issues can be understood by reading the theologians of the early church. We will now survey some of the people and issues that captured the attention of the early church as they developed a basic ethic. First, let's consider Clement of Rome. A Clement of Rome, who lived around AD 96, is a very early theologian in the patristic period. His concerns shed a great deal of light on the issues that concern the church. He counsels his readers to define themselves by God. Clement further depicts God as creator and giver. Clement worries the very gifts of God will become a source of condemnation for those who do not live worthy lives. Clement understands God is very close to human life and that no secrets can be kept from him. Christians should not be concerned with offending people. Rather, they should be concerned with offending the God who has gifted them for holiness. Clement urges his readers to be eager to do what is good. Clement does not employ the language of morality. Rather, he defines this good behavior as holiness and faithfulness. Therefore, the moral reflections of the early church were inseparable from the theological affirmation. The holy life is motivated by the vision of good that can be seen in the acts of God toward creation. Holiness is embodied salvation in some sense for Clement of Rome. Two things are very evident in the moral reflections of Clement. First, moral advice grows materially out of theological convictions. Second, the language of morality or virtue is defined in such a way that it is clear whatever life emerges from the gospel is both a gift of God and a response in time by a human creature. Those within the Wesleyan holiness tradition know this is holiness in heart and life. The Didache. The Didache, uh, early 2nd century AD, is essentially an attempt, an early attempt, in fact, to order the faith for purposes of instruction. It contrasts life and death, or for our purposes, virtue and vice. It is extremely helpful for understanding how the early church joined faith to morality. This document unpacks the teachings of the gospel and specifically connects these teachings to moral imperatives. The first of the ways defined in the book is called the way of life. This way embraces the love of God and neighbor. It blesses those who intend harm. The way of life abstains from carnal passions. It turns the other cheek. It is one that gives to the needy. The way of life is defined by integrity, honesty, graciousness, and character. It avoids even the appearance of evil. 
The way of life honors family and the means of grace. It avoids the attempt to appear good while really being evil. The Didache admonishes that those who seek to inherit eternal life should listen to the gospel and then do the gospel. Another way characterized in the Didache is the way of death. Wickedness and blasphemy define this way of being in the world. Such things as murder, adultery, lust, fornication, robbery, idolatry, dishonesty, malice, greed, coarse talk, and so on, characterize this way that leads to destruction. Those who live this way of death plot against righteous people. These people are vain, look for profit, have no pity on the poor, and in fact, they are oppressors. This early document, the Didache, uh, from the second century, illustrates the importance the early church placed upon morality. They understood that what one believes, if he or she truly believes it, will serve as a guide to behavior. The early church expected a life born of God to bear the fruit of righteousness. The early church, relatively untouched by deontology or teleology, uh, set about the task of linking faith and virtue. If it is the righteousness of God that informs patristic ethics, then an argument could be made for deontology. This is because the fixed good in the life of God is known and applied by faith as a Christian duty. If the end of a Christian life is to reflect the glory of God, then an argument could be made for teleology. This is because the meaning of life is determined by holy end as a consequence of righteousified living. Next, let's consider Justin Martyr, who lived uh, A.D. around 155. Uh, he belongs to that group of early church theologians called apologists. They were called this because these men sought to offer a reasoned defense of the Christian faith to Jews and pagans. These theologians offer a clear insight into the early doctrine and ethics of the church. Justin counsels his readers to live as honorable citizens of the empire. They should pay taxes. Christians should pray for their rulers. Justin, Justin believed we will be judged by our actions. In other words, faith must be embodied, or else it is not the faith. Justin is very critical of an early heretic named Marcion, who did not believe that God could have created the universe. Many in the history of the church have had difficulty with the Christian teaching that in God the material and the eternal are joined. The life of the spirit takes shape in the routine life of physical human beings. Therefore, a holy God can and does create matter, and he redeems it as an enfleshed God. Justin is clear in his understanding that evil is not created by God. Rather, human beings, freed to be like God, can become evil. When this happens, goodness is inverted, and it becomes evil by human action. Justin, Justin even believed those who live in accordance with reason are Christians, even though they were called godless. This is an early testimony to how firmly some early Christians linked Greek philosophy and the Christian faith. It constitutes any early orthodox theology that suggests God who creates has left his fingerprints on creation in the form of a rudimentary rationality. In order to believe this, the modern separation of sacred and secular must be avoided. Accordingly, God creates one world and expects us to be like him with our feet firmly on the ground and our eyes fixed on him. Justin also affirms the Christian responsibility to care for the needy, the widows, and the orphans. Because Justin totally dismisses the separation between the material and the spiritual, he thinks Christians should be concerned with such earthly matters as hunger and sickness. Next, let's look at Tertullian. Now, he lived in the early 3rd century AD. He was also an apologist. He's best known for the rhetorical question, what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? His answer is, absolutely nothing. Tertullian is unrelenting in his call for Christians to live a distinctive life characterized by morality. He takes up the question of child murder in his writings. Tertullian concludes that murder is always wrong, and he includes within this condemnation the practice of abortion. He calls it a 
speedier man killing. And it is just as wrong to do this as it is to murder a mature human being. He tends to oppose adoption because it might lead to incest once the history of the child has been forgotten. Tertullian condemns all forms of vengeance in his writing. He feels the wrath of the mob almost always acts immorally. Tertullian is afraid of the mass mentality that can come to characterize actions of groups. He counsels his readers to love their enemies, for this is a Christian duty. Tertullian reflects on the characteristics of Christian society. These characteristics are common Christian profession, commitment to Christian discipline, a unique hope in the world to come. Such a society will pray and worship, seek to embody good habits, love one another, and seek to live in the truth. Tertullian's moral reflection is very practical. He needs no theory because he has the theology of a holy God. Because of God, there is no need for Athens, the philosopher, to be consulted. Rather, the very faith of the community that seeks to name God in their worship is sufficient as a resource for the moral life. Clement of Alexandria lived about 215 AD. He's an able theologian in the early uh, church who offers a good deal of insight into Christian morality. His theology reflects philosophical depth and indebtedness to Greek categories of thought. Clement read scripture and found much that connected with philosophical sensibilities regarding God. He was particularly impressed with the transcendence of God. That led him to be fairly reserved in making theological claims about God. Yet, because his theology was mature, he talked a good deal about morality. For example, he reflected upon the difficulty of the rich getting into heaven. Clement felt the rich can, too, easily feel exempt from the struggles of faith a poor person might expect. He also felt rich people tend to presume too much and accept too much praise for their station in life. Clement thought those who beg and those who ask are likely to inherit the kingdom of God, but the rich are not likely to participate in these activities. In fact, the rich are so identified with their possessions that the very suggestion they could be sold and given to the poor is impossible to conceive. The reason for this might be that the rich have become their possessions. Clement thought the rich possess at the expense of the poor. This callousness keeps the rich out of heaven, according to Clement. Clement also instructed his readers to give attention to the body so its craving may not be unwisely satisfied. He did not so much deny the importance and role of the material in life as he decried its excess. He argued against slavish habits. He spoke against talking while we are eating since our jaws are too full to be understood. Here he was not so much dispensing table manners as he was suggesting that those who continue to fill themselves with the desires of the flesh will have little time to speak the truth. It is crucial to understanding that Clement had no problem with the material world. Rather, he was concerned with the ability to apply the limits. The theology and moral reflection of Clement of Alexandria illustrates a continuing tension in the early church. The language and thought forms of Greek philosophy led to the necessity of walking a very tight line. On one hand, scripture and the Christian faith give credence to the sharp distinction between life in the spirit and life in the flesh. One leads to life and the other to destruction. Yet, too often this juxtaposition has led those in the church to miss the middle ground. Put very starkly, life is the flesh is not the same as life in the physical. In fact, life in the spirit must be lived in the physical. When Paul denounces the flesh, he is not denouncing matter. Rather, Paul denounced living in the physical as if this is the end of all things. The early church struggled to pull together transcendence and eminence, but it always had a Christological language for such an endeavor. The Christian faith is lived in the material world with the spiritual reality as inspiration. Next, next, let's look at Ambrose, who lived uh, 339 to 397. 
Now, he's uh, the best known, is best known as the preacher, whose sermon convinced Augustine to convert. Yet, he was an important theologian and ethicist in his own right. The f familiar tension between the rich and the poor and the condemnation of greed find expression in his theology. He also emphasized the familiar admonition to love both neighbor and enemy alike. He feared that as Christians become more affluent, they would forget that all good gifts come from God. Ambrose urged Christians to offer hospitality and show compassion to those in need. He also counseled that women not be treated as slaves or coerced into action. He urged that husbands love their wives. Ambrose argued that children be loved by parents and trained for citizenship in heaven. It was important that children learn the difficult task of picking up the cross. Next, we look at Augustine. He lived 354 to 430, and in, uh, in, in some sense, he's the last of the patristic, patristic period and the first of the medieval period. His theology, as well as his moral vision, uh, sum up the early church and anticipate the medieval church, even extending to the Protestant Reformation. Augustine has affected the church's self-understanding in dramatic ways. He was born to a Christian mother and a pagan father. He struggled with guilt his entire life. Before his conversion, he fathered a child out of wedlock. His pilgrimage to the Christian faith was long, but his conversion was dramatic and transforming. It was from the ashes of his broken pagan life that one of the clarion voices of church history emerged. Augustine had an acute moral sense. Even before he was a Christian, he sought to live his life, however, unsuccessfully, morally. He was convinced as a Christian that an objective moral order existed and human attempts to embody it were doomed to failure. It was finally his nuanced doctrine of Christian charity that enabled him to define a Christian morality. Augustine refused to be satisfied with any morality that fell below the pattern set in Jesus Christ. Augustine's moral philosophy focused on the human will as it is pulled into two directions. First and most naturally, human life is grounded in self-love. Human beings love themselves first and last. Yet, human beings were created to love and worship God. Augustine calls this flawed human love cupidity. Now, this kind of love is disordered. It reaches in all directions, attempting to find peace, but is always, it always latches on to that which crumbles to nothing. A life based on cupidity is futile and pointless. Augustine felt his pre-conversion life was one defined by cupidity. On the other hand, Augustine thought our life can be defined by charity, that is, an ordered love. Such a life is defined by paying attention to the life as God would have it. Charity is possible only as a person participates in the life of God and faith. What is finally real and therefore good is found in God. Goodness is godness for Augustine. The crucial issue for Augustine was that the will participates in God, and only in this way can Christian virtue emerge. According to Augustine, we are born with an earthly, disordered love. While all finds its origin in God, all love that is finds its origin in God, it is expressed as sinful pride because of the disordering of cupidity. Therefore, cupidity is a deficit or an inversion of what is truly good. Cupidity can only be love in reverse. After all, a love designed to participate in God is expressed as idolatrous in the disordered life. By contrast, charity is of one piece and it opens life up to the community of faith as a mutual sharing in the triune life of God. Here is where the moral life flourished for Augustine. Augustine was fully committed to the idea that human beings are created by God as social beings. This places him firmly in the classical tradition of political philosophy. He believed God calls human beings into the church so they will be saved. He believed sin corrupts the world, as is evident in the degree of violence present. 
Augustine believed it was possible to wage war so long as the war is a response to a prior evil, proportionate and respect, respects the lives of innocents. The greatest achievement of Augustine's thought is the city of God. He sets forth a comprehensive treatment of the Christian faith in this book. Let's look at the importance of patristic ethics for Wesleyan holiness theology. The importance of patristic ethics is not exhausted by learning a few details about the first thinkers in the Christian faith. The following will offer a few reasons why it is important to think about the patristics when doing moral reflections. First, the patristic theology gives us a picture of the most significant issues that faced the generation that followed the New Testament. Therefore, it is clear that in the generation that followed the era of the primitive church, New Testament church, the nature of God and its relationship to morality were important. It is also clear the early church struggled with what to do with the wealthy and the material. The answers that arise from reading patristic theology continue to be important. Second, reading the early church fathers will help to define such central theological and moral convictions as eternal and temporal, infinite and finite, material and spiritual, in an attempt to distinguish classical Greek culture from the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. This will keep Christians from being lost in the thought forms of the prevailing culture. The temptation to surrender a Christian identity by degrees is as important now as it was then. Third, reading the early church fathers will remind those in the contemporary church to refuse a merely intellectual faith. Wesley would call an intellectual faith a form of religion or a form of godliness. The very practicality of early church ethics makes it very plain that the business of being a Christian is about how one uses money or treats his or her children. The message of heart holiness is one of integrity of thought and life. This is what the early church understood, and it is what the contemporary church cannot afford to forget. So, in review, now this lesson has dealt with the major issues and concerns of moral reflection in the early church, comprehending itself in the face of the Hebrew faith, contending with classic culture, and defining the faith in a pagan culture. Uh, also, we looked at the resources of moral reflection in the early church for contemporary moral problems, that is, struggle with the law, struggle against a permissive grace, sexual ethics, wealth, and others. Now, ways uh, We also looked at ways in which moral reflection in the patristic church inform Wesley and Holiness moral reflection. That is a picture of the New Testament church eternal and temporal, infinite and finite, material and spiritual, and warning against a merely intellectual faith. This period of history was crucial for the development of the Christian faith. Any serious attempt to think and act as a Christian must understand and embody the wisdom and insight of this period. Let me give you a closing thought as we end this lesson. Athenagoras, an early church father, lived around A.D. 177. He lived during the time of persecution in the church. It is interesting he chose to defend the church in his writings by saying, Christians do no wrong. He actually goes so far as to suggest that it is by the behavior of the Christians that those in power will know they are religious. Many Christians died in these days because they refused to accommodate to pagan culture. Those who live in the 21st century have much to learn from the intellectual tenacity and the moral convictions of these early Christians.